I'm Rob Lucaria Singh, editor at Gold Derby here with Tempe Lockby, co-creator, uh, writer, executive producer of From Scratch, Netflix's blockbuster uh, romantic drama limited series based on her memoir. Tempe, it's so great to have you on. Um, you know, I say this often to your colleagues from the show, watching it, I, I laughed, I cried, I, I laughed again, I cried, then I cried, then I cried. Uh, because this this series is so beautifully done. And I'm just wondering, what's your takeaway from the reaction that it's getting from the public about it? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here to talk about our show. And um, I think my largest takeaway is it, it, I didn't immediately understand, I could not have known the global conversation that got started around aspects of the show that directly deal with family repair and forgiveness. Of course, love is a clearly a big theme that, you know, that sort of um, conversation was shot around the world. But then the other piece um, is around how we say goodbye to our loved ones. I have gotten messages from South America, from Australia, from uh, China, from Russia, from France, from England, people saying effectively the same thing, that the show gave them a sort of a template or a model for how to have either a difficult conversation or how to say goodbye. And although that's something I know we hoped when we were making it and when we were shooting particularly episode 107, the fact that, that it's actually connected um, has been uh, incredibly moving to me. Yeah, like, you know, I've seen a ton of commentary on social media um, praising the show as a tearjerker, of course, but I found so many moments of joy, actually, in this show. There was a lot of happy crying, as well as, obviously, the grieving process, you know, when you you love a good cry because it kind of reminds you of your own loved ones. As you mentioned, a lot of that focuses on Lino's diagnosis and then, of course, his passing. So what was that like for you and Attica, particularly in essentially reliving that when writing the show and then during production, you know, that it just brought back, flooded back all the memories of when Sado had Yeah, um, well, we were very... Um... There's sort of two things. In the crafting of that on the page with our writers in the writer's room, we knew what our North Star was. Our North Star for that episode was we knew that we had um, made our audience, that we'd done our work well, fall in love with this character. And now his goodbye had to reverberate across many lives in our show, his family, his wife, his child, his friends, his in-laws. I mean, it was, and that the impact of that and the community, the communal feeling of that loss, right? That was sort of our path and our North Star. And of course, always centralizing Amy as the lead because she's his spouse and we're sort of following her story. Um, when it, and so in the writing of it, it was hard. And Marguerite McIntyre wrote that episode. And we, she really, said, Tempe, I'm going to lean on the book a lot to do this. Um, and the parts that we really leaned into in the writer's room was the communal feeling of that. Like in the book, I, there's not a scene when everyone gathers in the garden in the same way. So we took that event from real life and then we infused it with another aspect of real life that does not exist in the book. <laughs> and that then became that moment where the audience knows, everyone else in the room knows, or and the garden knows that this is this is the turning point. And Lino knows it, and we can see it on Lino's face. And I think that that walk up to that moment as a community and as a, a, a protagonist is something we hadn't quite seen on screen before, and we really wanted to bring it forward. And I think that's that impact of the joy, tears, the laughter, the sad crying. I mean, the, the, the you know, the sort of the tearful laughter. It all happens in that moment in the garden because it it you we're right there. And Marguerite did a great job writing that. And so that's what happened in the room when we got on set. 
for my sister and myself who lived the moment, and now we are recreating it for screen, it was very challenging from an emotional point of view insofar as we had to take turns and task ourselves with saying, okay, I can be here present for this moment, but I need to step away for me in particular um, because yeah. it was my direct lived experience. Um, and we really tag teamed with each other so that we could do the best work for the show, right? Because we understood that we it would be triggering. We understood that we were walking back into the hardest moment. Um, and so giving ourselves grace is what not only got us through it, but more to the point, it allowed us as creators and as craftsmen and as writers to bring the best work forward, yeah. right? So we have to take care of ourselves in order to do the work. That makes a lot of sense to me. And um, my understanding is that you were kind of blessed with a really an amazing crew. And you, know, you hear it all the time, oh, my crew is the best crew ever. But you had the Italian crew, you had the American crew, and um, everyone was very sensitive. Zoe mentioned it was a fragile set at times because of the, you know, the emotional resonance, particularly for yourself and also Attica. So um, what what can you really say more about this amazing crew that you got to work with over there? Um, well, the crew was incredible. <laughs> um, and I want to say, um, you know, we began filming in the pandemic. So yeah. we knew that we were asking of our crew, of everyone who walked onto set, many of whom were literally just, this was their first job out of lockdown, okay? So people have been in their homes for two straight years, <laughs> you know, or two and a half years, I mean, a year and a half at that point, yeah. and re-emerging, and this is the set that they're walking into, right? And there are, there are there's, there's a loss at the epicenter of the story, and many people had lost people. Yeah. during the pandemic and so um we were hyper aware as creators of the show and as the executive producers to really create a safe space and a landing spot for all of that um the crew was incredible and what i mean by what i what i specifically i want to talk about the ways in which people were willing to share parts of themselves mm -hmm with us and i say with me often because they knew it was my book and many people had either read the book coming into the uh, work on the show or were in the process of reading the book and so and they wanted to tell their story they wanted to tell me and share with me an aspect of the story the scripts or the book that connected with them and I think that that open dialogue, so I remember at craft service in the morning, getting coffee or in the, in the van riding where that sort of open exchange, we were very clear that we were all stepping into very vulnerable, as, as Zoe said, tender, fragile spaces. And so I tried to make space to receive and to hear those stories and in turn, welcome any feedback yeah. that they might have as a crew. Like I, I remember very specifically our props um, one of our, our props guys was like, who volunteers as a hospice worker. That's what he does. In addition to working in props in Hollywood, he said, you know, I've been in this situation many times as a volunteer, and I'd like to offer this piece of information. And that was an act of generosity because one, he didn't have to share any of that. Right. And two, I think he understood that we had created a space where he could come forward and yeah. share that. And when he did, there was something in it that I said, thank you for sharing. And I sort of took it back to the team and we sort of filtered it through that, that moment, that thing. And, you know, it, it added an, another element. Yeah. And we daily, we did it in the United States with our American crew. And then when we got to Italy, we did it again with our Italian crew because our Italian crew, each of them is bringing, we wanted everyone to bring their lived experience to the, to work every day. And, and, and because for us, it's like, I know, I know as the creator, co-creator and as the writer of the book, if I'm asking people to step into my story, I want to be here to hear your feedback and your lived experience because it can, it can have value. And it did many times. And I loved that sense of openness and camaraderie that we had as a crew and the willingness to take care of each other. When we knew we needed a dance party, we were like, okay, it's dance party time. And everybody gets to have dance parties. 
that's indicative to me that you, uh, Attica as a showrunner and yourself, created and fostered a set that was open and warm. And it also in indicates that you you have a high level of emotional intelligence. Empathy is so important to storytelling. Um, and uh, and, it, and it, it really comes off the screen. I want to talk about some of the more positive, well, not positive, well, um, happy aspects, because the the uh, the grief is a huge anchor on the, for the series. It's very important to it. But <clears throat> when anyone who's been to Italy, and I have many times, knows that there's something so entrancing about it when you get there. You've seen it on postcards. You've seen it in travelogues. But you get there and it's... It, it kind of seeps into your DNA. And I felt that immediately from episode one. Um, and I know from people who have read your memoir, I have not, but I will, that you are very good at pinpointing that emotional feeling you get from Italy. Um, what, what Did you find it challenging to, to uh, portray or depict Italy in that way on the series without it looking just like another travelogue? Um, yes and no. <laughs> so one of the things I was very clear about was I did not want to create just a generic, hi, this is Italy, we all love it, it's beautiful, there's the David, oh, you know, there's the Duomo, oh, look at the Ponte Vec. No, I mean, come on. Like, uh, no. Um, I wanted to, and we as a team wanted to show Italy through the lens, and this was always, this was what made the difference for us, through the lens of a Black American woman. That is not an Italy we've seen on screen. And so no, the thing that Amy would point out or would see or would notice might be different from someone else, right? Who we would typically see as a protagonist on screen. And so that then meant that we are going to look at the immigrant community in Italy. Right. That means we are going to look at the sort of racial component that we are seeing on screen and any nuances around language and around race and color that we are seeing, um, because that was my lived experience in Italy, right? <laughs> and so I, we wanted to bring that um, um, you know, to the screen at the same time that we are seeing also the lushness, the beauty, the sort of aesthetic pleasure that you know Italy offers but always and I really I want to credit Nzinga Stewart our producing director who shot the pilot um it is so beautifully shot and it is so sensual and inviting and um unlike anything that you know we we've ever seen and a lot of that is is the work we did as a team but it's very specifically um Nzinga bringing her lens you know to Florence yeah, and there's so much to it as well. It's the color palette uh, of your costume designer. It's your music director, um, supervisor, using a, a song like um, Nell Blue, Deep Pinto Deep Blue um, by Malika Ayano. And um, like, there's so much that you put into this to give it a little bit of spice and color that um, I wasn't expecting. As a Sicilian man myself, um, we all have something when we watch a show that we grab onto because of our own shared experience and mine is I've never seen a show that that has portrayed and depicted Sicilian culture so authentically and I really appreciated that my parents in their 70s who were born in Sicily um, were just enraptured by this show they just couldn't believe how beautifully done it was and I want to find Peride Benesse and just kind of watch every single thing he's ever done so that brings me to this, like that, that would have been a, a great achieve, a, a great thing to kind of work through and, and get right with the Sicilian crew and the Italian crew. But you've got Eugenio Massandrea, who is at the kind of, you know, the focal point of the Italian side of the show. And he's a star to me. Like, he is going to be huge. And you guys were the ones that get the credit of kind of like discovering him for American audiences. What did he bring to the set that you really appreciate? Oh. What did he bring to the set? Um, no, you're right. Uh, uh, first of all, our Italian casting, which was at the hands of Armando Pizzuti, who's out of Rome, was incredible. Just writ large, up and down, across the board, incredible. And it begins with Eugenio. Um, we cast Eugenio over Zoom. He was in Rome. Yeah. And, you know, I knew, we all knew that, um, and I knew more than anyone else, it was going to be a difficult find to find Bellino, 
Um, yeah. One, because based on my late husband, I thought, well, and I knew he had to speak you know, English, Sicilian, and Italian. Um, he had to be handsome. He had to be dynamic. He also had to be tender. He could be a little bit sarcastic. He could be, you know, sort of stubborn, but also incredibly vulnerable. It, it was all the things. Um, and Eugenio's audition tape um, stopped me cold when I first saw it. And I thought, okay, I'm not quite sure if I am responding as the person who knew the person that this is based on, or am I responding as a producer? And so I sort of quickly said, I'm going to re return to this audition tape later. I need a little bit of distance. I watched it again and again and again. And each time I found something new in it. And when we got on the Zooms with him for the callbacks, he did many callbacks. And finally, he did the callback with, with, with Zoe. And I thought to myself, okay, here's this young actor who's been doing theater in Rome and in Italy, some you know Italian television, but not a lot. And now he's on a Zoom, you know, in two different continents with one of the biggest global stars in the world. <laughs> yeah. And is he going to be able to hold his own, right? And will there be a chemistry? And that day there was chemistry coming off of our screens. And I thought if they can create this chemistry in two different continents across a digital medium, we're going to be fine. And when he eventually came to the United States um, and we had his first you know, screen test and wardrobe and all the things, his, his epicenter as a human being is a very expansive place. And you can feel it when you first meet him. And he is willing, he has a great deal of willingness and his willingness to step into the unknown, which we knew he was going to have to do as this Mino, um, he's game and he was game. And the spirit of that shines through. And then of course, as we began to round out the rest of our cast, Eugenio, Parede de la Sal, Lucia Sardo, and um, Roberta um, all became a kind of a, a family in and of themselves here in the States. For each of them, it was their first time working in the United States. Um, for three of them, it was their first time ever visiting the United States. And that closeness um, that we see on screen is reflect was reflected off screen as well. And I, 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 I really, um, we'll always be incredibly grateful to Eugenio for being game and willing to sort of take the big leap yeah. of playing in a big field and on a big canvas for his the very first time and doing it wonderfully. Yeah, huge thing for him. Um, and you know, and it, and it could have gone so badly, and yet here we are. He's and he told his nonna. That was the first person he told when he his grandmother for people who don't speak Italian when he got the role. But listen, the, the big factor for me was if the lead actress doesn't cut it, unfortunately, your show falls apart. You get Zoe Saldana. She comes on as a producer early on. She's outstanding. I, I'm begging any voters to consider her for a nomination because it's the best work she's ever done to date in her young career. And she's playing you. That's a huge, there's so much going on there. We could spend hours talking about this, but just generally, because it's our last question, what, how critical is Zoe to the success of this show? Because she is phenomenal. She's everything. She's everything. It begins and ends, it begins and ends with her. It begins and ends with her, the first frame and the last frame of the series. And I was incredibly moved, incredibly humbled, grateful. Um, that she was willing to come along and at the end to adapt this book for screen, that she was willing to go into the hard, dark, um, unknown places and traverse an emotional landscape while also being funny, while also speaking two different languages on screen and playing a character that spans some 14 years. Um, in her first television yeah. series. <laughs> uh, and, and so I am incredibly uh, grateful to her. And there are moments that she offers this series that are indelible and people will never ever forget when you've seen them. And um, she's a force, she's just a force, she's a force. And so I, um, 
feel like, you know, it was funny when, when we first knew that she was interested and, and she might come on and she and her producing her partners were her sisters. I also work with my sister. I mentioned it to my daughter and my daughter said, a superhero mom? She said, a superhero is going to play you? And you know, what I come, you know, through the whole time um, of filming, I kept thinking, you know, it, it, the character, the way Zoe offers us Amy, she is leaning into the superpower of, of, of love, you yeah. know, out the show and the series. And she does it wonderfully. So I think she should get all her flowers and a ton of awards <laughs> because yeah. she's, um, she's beautiful. And it was not easy. It was a hard shoot and she um, was incredible. Yeah, she mentioned that as well, given her, her past experience with loss and grief, um, which I think is just so universal. It's one of the reasons why people are really getting into the show. Um, Tembi, thank you so much for your time today. I wish I could just keep you here for hours because there's so much more I want to talk about. But congratulations on, on some beautiful work. I look forward to seeing what, what you, you and your sister have next to offer because um, well, we really enjoyed the show. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Tell your parents hi. I'm glad they enjoyed the show. I think it's the highest compliment when Sicilians, when Sicilians see themselves and recognize it. So thank you.